introduction. And I'm happy to be here today to um, talk a little bit more about the, this work, which is a collaboration with other researchers at the University of Southern California, University of Harvard, and uh, University of Texas at Dallas towards human-guided machine learning. And for those who have been in the keynote, I think some of these concepts will resonate because there is a slight overlap. Because it's all about um, AutoML, right? There we have been, uh, we have seen a rise in popularity of AutoML systems in the last years, and I'm enumerating, I'm displaying some of them in the lower part of the slide here. Uh, you see some that are based on Scikit-Learn with AutoScaler, and then you have some others which are based on Weka with AutoWeka. A uh, teapot, which has like an evolutionary, uh, sorry, a, a genetic algorithm. Then we, uh, the speaker this morning has introduced Alpha Zero, but we have others like Auto uh, Keras, and and uh, some others that that already exist and are uh, being more and more utilized. So. What are, how, how do AutoML systems work? We have seen a small introduction this morning, but in a nutshell, this is the, the architecture, how, how they plan to work, right? So the idea is that you give to this system your training data, and what it gives you, what it spits out like a trained model that you can use with your test data to produce predictions. So you just forget about um, all the, uh, different uh, things that you have to do within the machine learning training process, which, uh, in the, uh, which is not only training the algorithm itself, it's also it's about extracting the features of your data in case that you're dealing with text, video, or audio. It also uh, deals with data preparation because depending on the machine learning classifier that you are interested in, you may have to prepare the data in a certain manner. Also the feature selection, hyperparameter optimization, and assemble, assembling of solutions if you want to al also combine some of the solutions of the trained models that are uh, produced by the AutoML system. And some of the solutions that I presented in the previous slide will accomplish uh, several or one, one or more of these tasks, right? Um, however, what, is, uh, what are the limitations? Well, the thing is that uh, you don't see this process, right? It's, uh, like a, it happens over there, it's behind the scenes, and you get your trained model, and this is fine for uh, if you just want to consume, if you don't care about this, right? But uh, the problem is that sometimes these models are difficult to customize and uh, <coughs> the output is not very transparent. When, uh, when you, maybe if you are in a big company and you're just interested in creating pr uh, predictions with your data for a very particular problem, as I said, this is fine. But when you are collaborating, for example, with domain scientists that want actually to do science with the help of an uh, AutoML system, this is not enough because, first, they don't, they don't like black boxes. They want to be part of the process of the training, right? They want to also share their expertise, their, their expertise in the data. And they want to reflect that into the training process. That means that uh, well, they want to know more about the features that are being used to train the particular model. They want to know, uh, they want to just um, remove certain features or remove certain instances and see what happens. They want to know how the data is imputed in case you're imputing data because uh, it might change uh, your results in, in a manner that they are, they, they are, uh, they feel very responsible about what the, the um, AutoML system is, is returning, right? And they want to be part of this process. So in our work, what we are, we are aiming for is to understand this process better. And what we have done is that, well, we had like um, a previous existing AutoML system and we have been collaborating with, with uh, um, people, um, uh, researchers that have been uh, creating user interfaces. And what we, are, we, what we did is was at first to create a first interaction between our AutoML system and the UI to support what we call basic HTML uh, human-guided machine learning interactions, which is uh, having a human in the loop and interacting with, with, the, with the AutoML system. And what we did was a task analysis of this human-guided machine learning process that enumerates the, the, the tasks that are necessary to be supported by both the AutoML system and the user interface. We did this uh, not only based on our own expertise, but also looking into the literature uh, to two very um, methodological papers where basically you see how the main scientists operate and the, uh, what are the main tasks that these scientists do. 
And what we did is, we, based on this task, we created a set of requirements, and we did try to do, okay, well, these are the, the main assessment of, of what are the changes that AutoML systems and UIs need to support in order to address these requirements. So, uh, let me start by um, just showing the, how our um, AutoML system works, right, in order to illustrate better this process. And because this is like the basis for the uh, human guided machine learning system that we started setting up. And um, going back to the architecture uh, picture that I said before, it's very similar, right? So we just feed the system a problem description, whether you want to classify, well, what, has, what are the type of problem that you are interested in solving? Like, it would be classification or regression problem, community detection, etc. You feed in the training data, and we give a little bit more um, freedom on selecting what are the uh, evaluation metrics that you are interested in. And then what you get out of this is like a a set of uh, like a ranking of solutions stating what are the pipelines and what is the nature of the pipelines that have been used to accommodate and to, to address this problem. So for example, uh, if you gave text uh, for text classification, you will have to maybe use a TF IDF vectorizer, then a label encoding, and finally your classifier, depending on the, on the problem that we were interested in. And, um, well, the, the nice thing about uh, this uh, uh, system that we, we created, which is P4, P4ML, is that it extracts the feature of interest out of the data, also do, does data preparation and searches for the appropriate type of model to, that is more um, com better suited to address your type of problem. It does hyperparameter tuning and also creates an ensemble of some of the solutions listed in the ranking. Then, um, we connected this system, uh, P4ML, with a UI for doing AutoML interactions, so you, you wouldn't have only uh, access to just raw data and you feed that into the system, but to uh, facilitate the configuration of the, of the overall uh, interaction, right? So in this UI, you can see more or less uh, what are the the main features of the system. So it will tell you what is the distribution of the different features that are in the training data, and whenever you uh, send a solution back to the AutoML system, you would retrieve back what are the results, how has it performed, and how, how has it been the accuracy of the problem. Um, this is a very basic interaction, right? Because we can see, well, as, as you will uh, you see afterwards, there are still many things that are not yet supported. Um, so. What, what did we do after we had like this baseline, which is like very basic interaction? Then what we did is, okay, we thought about a top-down analysis, which was uh, based on our experience and, and um, also conversations within other people in, in projects and the, and the programs that we are participated in. And we basically um, extracted three main types of tasks that people may be interested in when, when uh, doing this type of interaction, which are like uh, the selections of variables and instances, how to tune the model, whether you are interested in, in uh, applying certain parameters of, uh, to a particular model, and then finally model interpretation, because, well, sometimes you may want to compare different approaches when, before uh, deciding for a particular model. And then what we did, which is also one of the main contributions of the, of the paper, is that we perform these bottom-up analysis based on two methodological papers in different domains to analyze what are the common practices by domain scientists. One of the papers uh, is in political sciences, which is in the top left. And um, this is uh, particularly interesting because uh, basically it goes to a previous co paper that had a conclusion on how um, oil exports created civil over onset and tried to refute the, the conclusion based on a detailed machine learning analysis on the sources, on the methodologies. So it basically tells, the paper tells you how step by step the author went to the sources, tried to reproduce the initial analysis, then it tried different imputation methods, then trying to complete the data, then tried to filter certain instances in order to uh, demonstrate how the initial conclusions and p-values obtained by the authors didn't hold very well. So it's very, very insightful because it, it is very, very detailed. And the second paper on the bottom right 
it's on neurosciences, and it represents uh, it represents the, the the work by a whole consortium of uh, globally distributed scientists who work on neurodegeneration, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and that have been uh, doing well different machine learning analysis to also uh, with, with medical data. So uh, what we did is that uh, I'm not going to go into very detail of, of the tables. You can find them further in the paper. But the main the, the main takeaway here is that we try to divide this task, organize them, and um, reason the, in the top-down analysis, reason over why would users be interested in this type of, of new interaction, and what is the guidance, right? Which part of the machine learning process would be affected by this, by, uh, by this activity? While in the bottom-up analysis, we reach, and, uh, we reach for, uh, in, in both of the papers, what are the specific activities that the users were interested in doing and generalize a little bit, also categorizing them. The main task results from the bottom up analysis indicate that, well, they are very interested in, in the feature selection and generation on, 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 well, on features for their analysis. Um, also the model type selection and configuration, and also the metrics that are being used to, to qualify the results of each of their analysis. Based on this task analysis, what we did, again, was to uh, try to gather um, requirements and see how they would affect more the, the AutoML system, which is like the planning system that would become, come up with the solutions, or the UI, right? And we categorize them in these, in, in these other tables in the, in the paper. So by combining all these top-down uh, top and bottom-up task analysis. And finally, what we try to do is reflect, okay, well, since we didn't have enough time to, to implement all these new requirements into our combined system, because it's a significant amount of work, what we did was to assess how AutoML systems and UIs would need to be changed to accommodate these requirements. And uh, well, and, and here I introduce some of the changes that we are actually adding to our uh, current system to support these kind of interactions within the AutoML. Um, in the AutoML system, would translate to having like another file to be able to uh, tell the restrictions that the user has to the actual system, right? And from the UI, you would be it would be, additional extensions would be necessary to support specifically all the uh, generation of new features, like um, users maybe um, usually want to combine different entries from the existing data to create new features that can be used for the analysis and also the comparison of work uh, of existing pipelines, which is not straightforward because, well, it depends first on how, how long do the pipelines tend to execute, right? And it takes a little bit of, of work to actually come up with all the comparison and exploration of, of previous work so you know that you are not repeating what you have already done. So, um, in conclusion, the main takes away here, the main takeaways here is that um, given the proliferation of, we have seen a proliferation of uh, AutoML systems that um, address a main requirement or that aim to facilitate how machine learning is done with uh, end users, and that is great, right? But that doesn't cover all use cases, and there are many users that want, want are not the machine learning experts, but want to know more about, uh, um, or they want assist, assistance in how the process is performed. And that's what we came up with, the human human the loop, human guided machine learning and um, we came up with this uh, baseline H, uh, HGML UI and, and AutoML system integration. We gathered the requirements and we assessed how these requirements would need to be performed uh, by auto, both, auto ML, both from the UI perspective and the AutoML perspective. And of course in our future work is <laughs> making this possible. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Danielle. Um, so we have time for questions. Why don't I ask a question while everybody else thinks of another question to ask? There is a question over there. Where? Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. Um, so very interesting book. I, um, I'm curious, so one of the reasons why Ashwin this morning was arguing you don't want to do expert design features mm -hmm. is because experts cannot design those features really well. 
And here you are sort of arguing the other point that experts have a lot of knowledge about the domain and so using, the, but the approach that you described, it, does it merge both of those kinds of knowledge or are you thinking more about either or? Mm, well, in our experience it's not that they are experts in feature engineering. It's just that they, they are the ones who know their data the best. So they, uh, maybe if you, if you tell them, well, yeah, um, they, don't know, they don't know whether maybe that's going to be the, the feature that is going to uh, address whether it's going to predict uh, a neurodegenerative disease or not. But they know that it is important and they want to, they want to play around with it. Is this, is this idea of I want to try this, it's a hypothesis-based uh, testing, right? They, they have this hypothesis, they say, well, I think that the combining this might provide better results. And uh, the problem of hyperparameter tuning and also feature selection is that the search space is huge. So what they have is like very good strategies for pruning and scoping what is the type of analysis that they want to direct. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the question. There's a, another question back there. Hi, Daniel, thank you for, for your talk. I tweeted it, by the way, so you can retweet later. <laughs> uh, I, I, um, I, one question I have is that, well, uh, one, one perspective that one might take, maybe you can have a comment about it, is that uh, when you have an auto ML system, one thing is related to hyperparameter optimization and several other task that you want to automate, and maybe you want to make the user aware of this, mm -hmm. but the other is more related to maybe the potential meaning and the effect that can have like uh, aspects like fairness, uh, transparency, uh, right? Uh, so have you th thought, or maybe in your project, that maybe you can make people aware like, hey, you know, that you have this system, predict super well, but is biased towards this type of thing that might be important. If you can comment about that. Yeah, so one of the things that we, we always wanted to make um, very clear is that they, they know what, first, what is the provenance of, of, of the process. So uh, we show not only the ranking, but also what is the structure of all the, of all the solutions. And also one of the reasons why doing this is by, because, um, well, when, they are the ones that may be aware of the biases. We are not doing any, any work towards detecting bias of the possible solutions, and that's a very fair thing to, to, to explore in the future. But uh, when, when we also talk to them, they are the ones that are worried precisely that if we just feed everything into the system, the system will learn biases that they want to remove. And, and within the tasks that you are identified, you have some of these tasks? We have not yet included ta tasks for removing biases, no. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do we have um, another quick question, maybe? Okay, perhaps I, I ask one while um, the last presenter uh, sets up. So, in your analysis of the requirements for the different use cases from, mm -hmm. um, was it political, sci uh, political science? And, yeah. Um, and others. Did you find the same requirements for mm -hmm. both or were there some differences and, and also what does that mean for say developing a user interface mm -hmm. that is common or do you need to make adjustments? That, that's a, a very good question because uh, is the list of all requirements complete? Could be, uh, a, it's a good question. So yeah, we saw overlapping from, from, the, from both of these papers, uh, but they also have like complementary aspects that we may, so maybe by, by opening also this list of requirements to the community, we might reach and say, oh well, how come they wouldn't think about this one thing that was missing? Uh, so yeah, um, that's, that's one of the aspects that, that there is room for improvement, yes indeed. And I just wanted to add before I leave that if you have any questions about how did we find the requirements for, from, from the paper, Shikhar is here. He did the, the hard work uh, analysis on how do we extract it from the papers. And well, I'm sure that he will be more than happy to talk to you. Okay, great. Let's thank Daniel.